Welcome to Behavioral Health Champions, a series of interviews in which we engage in conversations with state lawmakers, with constitutional officers, and others about how California can serve as a national role model when it comes to providing parity in the area of behavioral health. I'm Kevin Riggs on behalf of the Behavioral Health Action Coalition, a statewide organization that's committed to reducing stigma and also to increasing priority attention to this issue. Today in San Francisco, we are joined by the Honorable Fiona Ma, the State Treasurer of the State of California. Treasurer Ma, good to see you. Thank you, good to see you. Absolutely. So let me start a little bit with your, your background. You have been a CPA here in California since 1992. Uh, you hold a bachelor's degree in accounting, a master's degree in taxation, and an MBA from Pepperdine. So clearly you love numbers. How did that come about and how has that shaped your career? Well, uh, growing up, I was good at numbers, and so uh, my parents wanted us to be one of the lead professions, a lawyer, engineer, accountant, or a doctor. So because I was good at numbers, uh, my dad trained me to be an accountant, uh, my brother is an engineer, and my sister is a doctor today. So somehow, uh, you know, that uh, early persuasion actually worked. Uh, in our case. Um, so I started my professional practice working for one of the big eight accounting firms, so you can see how old I am. Uh, and then after five years, I left and started my own practice and became president of a small business association. And that was the first time I really got involved in public advocacy or service uh, representing women and minority small business owners. And so do you still use those numbers extensively today? Uh, well, I do. Uh, now that I am the treasurer of the state of California, um, I am constantly looking uh, at the budget, uh, the stock market, we're selling bonds, um, just making sure that we are fiscally um, in shape uh, and also reporting back to the governor and the legislature uh, in terms of how we're doing financially at the state level. And financially right now, the state's still doing very well. We are. We are doing really well, uh, thanks to Governor Brown, who um, who really tightened the reins, uh, paid off all of our debt and our credit cards, uh, put in about $20 billion into our rainy day fund right now, and that really helped our credit rating and our ability to sell bonds this year. Uh, so right now, we're doing pretty good. So your, your ex background in public service has been fairly extensive. Uh, before you were elected as state treasurer, you spent six years in the assembly. You were on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors for four years. What was it that led you down that path and decided to get into that world? Well, um, as I was starting, uh, like I said, um, as president of the Small Business Association, um, I started to lobby the Board of Supervisors, go up to Sacramento to testify, um, started working on legislation, uh, started meeting uh, political people, and one of those people actually hired me, uh, Senator John Burton. Uh, he wanted to hire me full time. My parents did not want me to give up being a, an accountant, so we made a deal and I worked for him for two and a half days, part time <laughs> as his district representative. And Honestly, working for the great John Burton, um, who is always fighting for the underserved, uh, those without a voice, those that are suffering, homeless, foster youth, mental health, um, um, you know, uh, people who are suffering from mental health and other ailments. I mean, that's what I did for seven and a half years for John Burton. So he was your political mentor. He was, and he still is. He still is, and so I never forget that there are people out there uh, that need help, that can't necessarily uh, navigate the bureaucracy and politics, and so, um, you know, I still work on a lot of those issues today. So as you, you talked about, the state treasurer's office uh, exists to provide financing for schools, roads, housing, recycling, waste management projects, other infrastructure uh, projects as well. So. Whether in your professional role or otherwise, how have you connected with folks who have had issues with behavioral health? In other words, how did this issue become so important to you? Yes, yeah, so I think it started uh, just in our own home. Uh, my mother uh, pretty much uh, suffered from uh, mental illness uh, since as long as I can remember. Uh, back then when she was working, um, she was able to hide the signs a little more, but as soon as she came home, she would go to, to, to sleep 
uh, wouldn't wake up. Sometimes she could spend, you know, the whole weekend sleeping. So it was a um, depression. It was it was a depression. Yes, uh, that um, that she was born with. Uh, as we now know that there is a chemical imbalance that people have, um, but then it also can um, be triggered through uh, personal situations, right? Um, you could lose a job, you could lose you know, someone a life, it could be through stress at work. Um, so me and my family, we have learned a lot um, just you know, caring for her and trying to understand uh, what it's like to have and suffer from mental illness, but then also, you know, what the family members also go through, right, in trying to help or find a cure or, or you know, not understanding why, you know, she's sleeping or, you know, she, she doesn't want to talk uh, that day. So it's not really that easy. And so when I um, was on the Board of Supervisors and in the legislature, I spent a lot of time on mental illness, uh, as well as other diseases and, and um, issues that have a lot of stigma related to it. Uh, for example, domestic violence. Um, a lot of people don't want to talk about it, but domestic violence does not only, um, you know, affect a, the person's home, but it actually uh, overflows into a person's job, you know, the rest of the family uh, and the society. So I talk a lot about it. Uh, I try to encourage uh, people who um, are suffering from it or I've been battling it to actually talk about these issues because if we don't talk about it, then it just stays uh, under the rug uh, and then there's never any treatment for it and there's never any help and people feel helpless and, um, and then there's no data. And when there's no data, there's no funding uh, that follows, uh, as I have found out uh, working in government, that if people don't perceive that this is a problem uh, through statistics and data and numbers, uh, there's never any money to go toward that um, treatment. Yeah, you got to have the attention paid to it. Exactly. Did your family have a difficult time connecting her with, with the services that she needed, or was she unwilling to seek the services? Because, as you said, often stigma is such an issue that people don't want to talk about it or even acknowledge that they have a problem. Yeah, I mean, part of it is the person has to recognize that they have a problem. Uh, secondly, they have to want to do something to get better. And uh, when you suffer from mental illness, um, it's not always uh, easy for that person to seek treatment. And when they do want to seek treatment, the treatment is not necessarily available because by the time uh, you make an appointment, sometimes it takes a week to go see your doctor. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes there's follow-up and then you have to go to the drugstore to pick up the prescription and then you have to go back and see your doctor. I mean, uh, for someone who suffers from mental illness, it's very hard for them to get treated uh, on their own. So it really depends on family members or caregivers to really follow up on those treatments or getting them to the hospital, making those appointments, right? Um, because when you do get depressed, uh, you just don't want to deal with it. You can't remember sometimes. Um, and so it just becomes this like cycle. And, and you talk about it, as you said, a lot now. Was that difficult at first? Uh, oh, absolutely. You know, uh, growing up in an Asian family, um, we don't like to talk about um, what's happening in the home, right? Because our whole uh, culture depends on saving face. And so nobody wants to talk about it. But uh, as I have uh, been in public service, gotten elected, I am very, very public about talking about problems. And um, after we do in public, um, so many people come and like they thank me. Um, for talking about it. Sometimes they think that they're a pariah, uh, that they, um, you know, it's unusual, um, that they can't have friends, um, they don't understand why, um, they want to seek treatment but they don't know how. Um, so it's all education, but it's also bringing uh, about that you're not alone, right? You're not alone. So we should uh, talk about it, seek help, and there is usually treatment. Yeah, and nobody knows that better than this Behavioral Health Action Coalition, which is an organization of more than 50 statewide groups, and they've come together to try and elevate and to innovate and to educate people about behavioral health. And I think what a lot of experts will tell you is that fundamentally we have separate ways to treat diseases of the body versus diseases of the mind. Um, talk about how that system is flawed and how we need to change that in your view. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in my opinion, doctors are overwhelmed. 
Um, there's not one size fits all, especially when it comes to mental illness. And the tendency, in my opinion, when you go see a doctor is that they just want to give you a drug because you want to feel better. They want you to feel better. Quick fix. Um, quick fix. <laughs> uh, but, you know, mental health really uh, is, is more deeply rooted sometimes. Sometimes you need, you know, psychological um, sessions. Uh, you need to feel comfortable with your doctor. You need to see them on a regular basis. And then if you don't have money, then you can't afford it if you don't have insurance. And so that also limits uh, your ability to get uh, the best type of treatment that you need sometimes. So sometimes it's lack of insurance, money, uh, doctors who perhaps are empathetic, uh, have the time to you know, do the proper treatment versus these quick fixes, which is just much easier. And for me, that's what I see is, is happening. So strategically, what can California do better with regard to people who are suffering through this? Yeah, um, for me, I think there has to be a more holistic um, you know, plan, treatment. Uh, it shouldn't just be go see a doctor, they prescribe medication, uh, and then come back and see me you know, when your prescription is, is done. Um, and that's what I see this revolving door is that people aren't really getting better. Uh, so, you know, having a plan, um, having doctors uh, that are available, that are working together uh, in a network, perhaps would be better. And I'll give you an example. Uh, Governor Gavin Newsom is putting more money into navigation centers uh, for the homeless. Um, as we see, there are more and more people sleeping out on the streets. Uh, one, because we have a housing crisis, uh, but two, because they don't want to come and, and um, uh, enter into a shelter because there's just too many rules, right? Um, so these navigation centers that we created here in San Francisco uh, bring people in uh, with their things, uh, with their pets, uh, with their habits, with their boyfriends or girlfriends, with their friends, right? All the things that, you know, that they feel comfortable with out on the street, we bring them in, and then we provide on-site, one-stop treatment. So we don't force people to go make a doctor's appointment. You know, if you don't have a phone, it's very hard, right? They don't make you take a bus. You know, they don't have, you know, money for an Uber. They may not be able to get to their doctor. As appointment across you know town then you have to go to your drugstore to go pick up your medication I mean it's just too much uh, for folks so these navigation centers um, are really these one-stop shop hubs um, which you know stabilize an individual and then transitions with social workers uh, and the specialists to get them into a permanent home where they are ready for it, where they do feel comfortable, where their uh, medications are stabilized. I mean, that's what we need, not only for the homeless, but I think for people who are suffering from mental illness. Even though you may have a job and you're able to maybe go to work uh, on a regular basis, those people that are still suffering still need kind of wraparound, one-stop shop uh, services. And you mentioned Governor Newsom. He's been in office since January. He has expressed often his interest in this behavioral health field, what opportunity does California have now to sort of reset the conversation on the issue with this new governor, given his interest, do you believe? Yeah, so uh, one thing, um, we're lucky right now because we do have some money um, that we have saved up for a rainy day, uh, but I think there's also a renewed focus on um, mental health services, uh, free preschool for every four-year-old. Um, making sure that we reduce child poverty. And there's a lot of reasons uh, that go into child poverty, and one of them is nutrition, right? Healthy foods, food deserts. Um, so I think this governor, Gavin Newsom, is really thinking on a more um, holistic uh, way about the person from birth uh, to, you know, being a senior um, versus just trying to, you know, attack the problems with Band-Aid solutions. Um, our system in government, unfortunately, doesn't focus on preventative health. Uh, it really focuses on sickness. Um, and I'll give you an example, um, hepatitis B. So I was born with hepatitis B, um, getting uh, three shots, which would prevent hepatitis B, uh, doesn't cost very much. It's like $25. 
I tried to pass legislation um, requiring insurance or Medi-Cal to cover uh, the uh, vaccinations and that didn't pass. It cost too much. Yet, Medi-Cal will pay $250,000 if you need a liver transplant. I mean, shouldn't we pay the $250,000 on the front end, front end to yeah. prevent people necess necessitating getting a uh, liver transplant on the back end? But this is how this whole system works with all of these diseases. We don't focus enough on preventative and we just focus on treating the illness once it's like out of control. So are we seeing more attention being paid to prevention and intervention at this point? Um, I. Not in government per se, uh, but I think the insurance companies, um, I've met with a number of them over the last few months and they really are trying to do more on the preventative end, uh, especially with telemedicine uh, where people uh, now can maybe call in um, and see their doctor or have uh, a checkup more regularly where they can be diagnosed earlier than later. Uh, I think these health systems are really focused on, you know, prevention, early prevention detection. This Behavioral Health Action Coalition that I mentioned, uh, they're really looking for all these opportunities to create more innovation, more elevation, more education, all of those things when it comes to this issue. How can the coalition, do you believe, work with you and people like yourself uh, to really come up with some meaningful changes to help families, do you believe? Yeah. Uh, a lot of the legislators are also focused uh, on these areas. Um, we have a lot more women uh, getting elected now and you know women tend to focus on issues that directly either affect them or their families as wives, as mothers, as caregivers. Uh, and certainly I would encourage folks to uh, reach out to their legislators, um, tell their stories. We have legislative action days and it is important when people come up um, and testify on behalf of bills, suggest bill ideas, right, uh, from the organizations that you represent. Uh, what are the top issues that we should be working on? And then present, find a sponsor, an author, uh, show up, um, get support letters, you know, try to get the bill uh, passed, but also showing up with real people. Um, that really makes an impact in the legislature is having real people come and testify about their problems versus the organizations are great with their statistics, but when you have real life people coming up, um, that's the way legislation, I, I believe uh, legislation moves faster. Puts the human face on it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right, State Treasurer Fiona Ma, thanks so much for your time and thanks for telling your story. Thank you. Appreciate that. And thank you for joining us for Behavioral Health Champions, again, a production of the Behavioral Health Action Coalition here in California, which is designed to really try and draw more attention to this issue across the state of California. Thanks for watching.